can start. Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome. Um, I'm really, really excited today. Um, the Barnard CSC and the program in computer science is really glad to be hosting Jan Nikolai Nels, who is a multidisciplinary media artist and technologist based in Berlin, Germany. And this talk is part of a larger arts and computing in New York City course that's being offered between Barnard College and the Fashion Institute of Technology. And to say just a few words about that, I'm going to quickly introduce Maria Huang, who is Assistant Professor of Computer Science at the Fashion Institute of Technology in the Science and Math Department, and Mark Santolucido, who is an Assistant Professor of Computer Science at Barnard College. Thank you, Saima. Um, and thank you for hosting this, and thank you to everyone who's attending. Uh, so just for some context, uh, the course that Saima had mentioned is a collaboration between Professor Huang and I um, between Barnard College and FIT that is co-sponsored in part by the Office of the Provost um, here at Barnard, as well as the NSF. Um, so this has been a class that's been really fun uh, so far, where we travel back and forth between the two campuses. Uh, very open-ended and project-oriented, where students are exploring computing in the arts uh, and arts and computing and what that means in the context of New York City and across the globe and um, the different technologies that go into um, creative applications of technology. So we're very excited that the um, CSC is helping us to host this talk. Thank you. Um, and so now I'll introduce our speaker. Jan Nikolai Nels is a multidisciplinary, not multidisciplinary media artist based in Berlin. His work pursues um, the approach and traditions of institutional critique and decolonial practices, and his art counteracts dom dominant narratives and the condition of cultural fracking by a majority society. Um, generating challenges for cultural institutions, including public museums through civil disobedience and creating techno heritage. His practice reflects on technology's potential to contribute to collective imaginaries, and overall his practice attends to the absurdity of the human condition. His work has been featured in the New York Times, BBC, The Times, Artnet, Wired, Financial Times, and many, many others. Um, Nikolai, the floor is yours. Thank you so much to everyone and thank you so much for joining and I will start by reading from my recent work the beheaded Buddha the beginning of the second part. Um, which is titled. Um, the body. I saw the decapitated body for the first time on a trip to the great temples of Angkor. The figures were themselves part of the buildings, temples, bridges, and gates. The building complex stretched over hundreds of square kilometers, where collapsed walls, destroyed structures, and parts of buildings form a seemingly endless pattern of ruin. Masonry crushed by century-old trees and roots, as well as missing and broken stones make these beheaded Buddhas appear as a collateral damage of erosion and decay. However, the central temple Angkor Wat was in excellent condition, and the figures also structurally framed are made of different stone or are set apart by differently worked polished surfaces. The headless body I met there, sunk in meditation, was witness to a violent past. It crushed immediate stuttering in my perception and a distinct moment of cognitive dissonance. I thought about the transparent display case. Displant, sorry. I thought about the transparent displays, display case in the back in the museum with the head that was missing there, as well as the thousands of other heads from Buddha figures of Angkor that were now scattered around the world. 
These questions accompanied me and did not let me go during my stay, nor after. I sat down on the large stone in one of the many winding and overgrown temple ruins. When a group of visitors, with whom we were guided through the site of as tourists, moved on, I remained seated. Most of them were already out of sight. Also, some stragglers were waiting to photograph the roots in the wall from yet another angle. It became quieter and quieter. Finally, as the last selfie stick disappeared behind the old wall fragments, it was truly quiet. The absence of voice and activity in this moment lingered in a strange way, and it was as if time stood still for a moment. As the next group of tourists began climbing over a, a junk temple wall, time restarted. It was always the same pattern, a swarm of visitors positioning themselves for a pictorial eternity. And each time the pause, the moment of the just before the camera was released, the change of position every time at every stop. There seemed to be a kind of collective consciousness about the most photogenic angle. Like the previous group, the new arrivals followed a similar rhythmic diminuendo and silent again. I tried to do nothing and tried to feel the place in its silence. The decapitated bodies remained silent. The next group of visitors again announced themselves. Slowly, I got, I got used to this rhythm. The interval, the intervals with, with which we pulsed through the temple ruins as a tourist body. The sweating body seemed to be chased by the efforts to store their best perspective on the memory cards and to create evidence for their own presence in this picturesque place. With each wave, I sank deeper into the stone I was sitting on. And the events of the history of this place passed through my imagination as the groups of tourists passed among the temples. I noticed that I was alone again. The tourists had moved on to new motives. Only the, tem the timeless silence could be heard. I took a deep breath and let go of my anger about injustice imperiousness and greed, peace spread out from the old walls of the temple. So, and what you saw in the background is uh, this is a set of uh, historic photographs from an exhibition in Paris, which took place in 1931. And in this world exhibition, this colonial exhibition, how it's called, um, they managed to reconstruct the entire temple of Angkor Wat, which is an immense building. It's a, 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 really large construction and um, yeah now I try to jump to the next I want to start with the the other other Nefertiti and um, in order to give you a, a overview I, I will play a video which summarizes um, from um, when this project uh, was, let's say, on its peak in a way, uh, and went viral and was uh, was in use. Now, there's a German equivalent of the Elgin marbles. It's the bust of the Egyptian queen Nefertiti, which sits in a museum in Berlin rather than in the vicinity of its creator. So the bust of Queen Nefertiti is a 3,000 year old work of art that was found in Egypt by German archeologists. In 1912, who discovered the house 
and the workshop of the sculptor, a man named Thudmosa. Currently, it's in a museum in Berlin with limited access to the public. Basically, there are no photos allowed. And for years, Germany and Egypt have fought over its rightful location, and the officials even claim that she was illegally stolen. Now, the Egyptians would love to have that bus back, but the Germans have guarded it jealously, even banning photographs. So it is pretty amazing that two artists have succeeded in taking a full 3D scan of the bust. Here they are, secretly scanning back in October last year. So two artists secretly 3D scan the bust and release the files to the public as a free download. Although museums have already scanned Nefertiti's bust, they actually don't plan to make it public, which seems kind of backwards because there's a lot of museums around the world that are hosting scanathons. That's where they let people use their smartphones to take a bunch of pictures of things, objects, and to make 3D scans of them. Now, it sounds a bit like Ocean's Eleven or one of these movies. What I don't understand is, I mean, this thing is obviously guarded, right? And you must have been there for, what, a few hours? And yes. how did you not get caught? I mean, what were you, how did you disguise yourself? This is like pirate 3D printing, folks. So we thought we would download the file and 3D print it ourselves on our 3D printer. We're amazed just how much detail was captured in the model. I mean, every little crack, chip, and scratch is fully visible, which is no surprise because the mesh has a whopping 9 million polygons. It's so detailed that if you throw it in your slicing software, it'll probably crash. But you do think the Germans should give it back, don't you, or not? Okay, and we stop there um, with a question to uh, all of you. Um, what do you think? Should the Germans give the bust back? Um, the other Nefertiti is about activating ancient artifacts, decolonizing our mind and setting a precedent for cultural commons. Why Nefertiti? We choose the bust Nefertiti because it is an artifact and an icon with its own symbolic and social power and a disputed bi biography. For us, the object was just powerful enough to speak on behalf of millions of stolen and looted artifacts held hostage in Western museums. Archaeological originals, originals as the cultural memory originates for the most parts from the so-called global south. However, vast numbers of these objects are kept in objecthood in the global north. We should face the fact that museums has the inherent has inherent colonial legacy and imperialistic structures. In 2015, we went public with this intervention. Um, this is more now for the background and um, for more than uh, one, uh, one year and a half, we were working um, on this. And even before we went frequently to Cairo, uh, for several years, we had friends there, uh, fellow artists, and uh, by this time we were intrigued of the um, power of the political movements resulting in the revolution, which uh, became known as uh, the so-called Arab Spring. Um, we connected with our, our artists and most of the cultural institutions uh, by then were closed by the authorities. Um, most artists worked on the streets, so um, we worked there too, we did murals, we related a lot of issues. It, um, there were no police in downtown Cairo and for months it, it, was, um, it was wild and um, I never experienced po political process as so tangible and vivid. Uh, in my life, uh, not before, not after. And technologies back then played a, uh, played a crucial role, like social media and messaging services played it, um, were fac facilitating a, a gray area to organizing and mobilization and communication. Um, before so uh, such platforms, and manipulators like Cambridge Analytica significantly impacted political and uh, politics and society in, in the US and Europe. Um, so it, it, was, it was kind of advancing this uh, 
um, there in, in Cairo and uh, other countries like Syria and India. And, um, So what, what, what was our intention um, back then? I, I mean, it, it, was, it was a really different uh, uh, time. It, it, uh, the last years had, had moved a, a lot in this, in this discussion. And um, how I felt the, the discussion was much more in an, in an, uh, an enclosed realm of, of Academia and post-colonial studies, and um, and it is it is so great uh, to to see that this discussion is now on on the agenda of of so many of so many um, people talking about this, and uh, um, for many reasons. Um, our mission was to declare the museum a public space. I genuinely, genuinely believe in museums as having the potential to be relevant spaces for society and discourses. But to achieve that, museums have to move on and reinvent themselves. If they are failing in doing so, they better shut down and go down with the patriarchy. I often felt misunderstood, maybe, uh, for my appearance or whatsoever, my dark voice or whatsoever, as fighting against the museum, yet the struggle was for the museum. Yet I want to be optimistic and stay positive, trusting in the process itself. And the digital turn could be a good starting point here. So, now this as an introduction, I. I'm gonna uh, tell you a little bit more about the the genesis of of, of our our project and um, how we how we uh, we did this. It, it was actually an, an open process. We we um, it started for sure with the scan. You saw the video of it which is a disputed topic itself. And the, as the moderator said, the whopping um, millions of polygons are surely not achieved uh, with a Kinect scanner. So um, it is doubtable that there is a, and a lot of, a lot of, uh, um, um, Ideas around. Uh, sorry, I, I I shouldn't go in this direction too much. So we I, I start by saying how 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 we did this again. Um, the video you saw, he, he played it on on the BBC there. Um, this is Nefertiti, how she's sacred stage in in the in the museum, and. Um, this is this is how we how we try to do our uh, essential surveillance on the spot to undertake the covered scan. So these these points are the the guards. There are two permanent guards and two guards which enter the space and and go out of the space. Um, so we know more or less when and where somebody could um, um, spot us. And after this, we went to Cairo in preparation for the other Nefertiti show. We wanted to show the, the bust of Nefertiti for the first time in Cairo, even so as a precise replica. We produced a video um, in order to, to um, create, a, create a, a discussion uh, around this or to prepare the, the, the soil for, for their queen return. And um, this video stages, uh, this video, oh, sorry, I'm too quick. This video stages uh, uh, 
potential second find of uh, or, or a find of a second bust of Nefertiti. And this find is plausible because you can assume that the sculptor Moses uh, created several pieces in his uh, workshop. Uh, to make the specific impact with this story, we got consulted by Dr. Monica Hanna, uh, one of Egypt's most renowned Egyptologists uh, when it comes to fight um, illicit trade and of antiquities. She advised us how to stage a real find of an artifact uh, in an ancient site in, in Egypt. Um, she shared the video for the first time on Twitter asking what if another head of Nefertiti would have been found. And we, the people were, were talking about this and we had also in Al Aram, the biggest newspaper in Cairo, an, an article launching. Um, yet it wasn't, it wasn't the, the effect we expected or we hoped for. Um, but the ministry of, uh, or a spokesperson from the Ministry of uh, Antiquities, um, where like shortly after the, the post of Monica Hanna, um, she, he, uh, the spokesperson was saying that, that it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not possible and whatsoever and, and shut the, the, our, our uh, humorous idea down. And so we went back and we went forth and uh, we, we made a new uh, 3D print, a really high precise one. And um, this is how it looks when you, when you ship Nefertiti through the uh, security check in the airport. Um, and later then there were taking place the Cairo off Biennale of Biennale because it wasn't the official one. Uh, it was a, a movement of, of a lot of known and emerging artists. And um, Simon Jamy was the, the curator and Mortas al Nasardin uh, was the, the, yeah, the principal organizer. And um, Okay, sorry. Now, now we jump. I, I show you sh shortly the video we we launched of the of the find. Monica Hanna was actually one of the first person to pointing out to me that the the skin tone of Nefertiti is way too uh, too clear. And it should be darker, so uh, we made it here much darker because he obviously was a person of color. So this this was the um, this was our our this is an exhibition view from from the from the show in Cairo. And yeah, we, we reconstructed the, the immense <laughs> bullet blue, bulletproof glass case around Nefertiti in the Neues Museum here in Berlin, which actually make, doesn't, doesn't make sense. I, I asked people in the museum and they explained me, yeah, it's because of uh, the the climate inside of the box because it, if it's too small and for me it looks like really big and it looks like a sacred staging uh, uh, like a a prison in a castle or something like this and the object was not a strict copy or a perfectly painted replica which only mimics the original still it confirmed cultural storage which doesn't try to conceal its origin as a technical reproduction, but embraces the value of the inherent digital information. And now, since, since we want to talk about uh, 
or we set out here to, to talk about digital preservation, I, I have a small remark on, on the digital. Like etymologically, it comes from digit. At least this is one of the roots. And um, we come back later too. And so if we are compare the digital and with it, um, if you compare the digital and with its counterpart, the analog, if, if, if we depict a, from, from the analog to the digital, it, it has to be described in numbers, the, what we want to digitize. And um, this happens in steps. There, there's, there's no way this is, this is seemingly exact, exactly the norm. Uh, the same one. I mean, there, there are mathematical forms and calculus to, to, to work around this, yet the digital will always be represented in something like digits or numbers. So um, by digitization, the transformation takes place in something that can be described in numbers. Yet what happens if the spaces between uh, the steps the in between the digits, are they empty? This, these are kind of the, the my, my open questions to, to, to circle, circle down what, what the digital is and um, what is missing there and does it matter? There, there are a lot of smart people thinking about this and um, for me, I just want to, to to bring it up and to raise the question as, as, an, as an open question and um, to question also the relevance for the issue of digital preservation. So back in Cairo, um, the feedback to the exhibition was very interesting, mostly positive and some visitors um, told us this 3D, print, this 3D printed bus in Cairo felt more authentic and essential than the one in Berlin. In contrast, others winked and said, who knows where the uh, Berlin bus is the real one. And one could ask, yeah, what, what is real? What is original after layers and layers of restoration? Um, what, what is left of the, of the artifact itself. Um, and my partner in crime in this endeavor, Noah Albati, used to say, uh, the copy is no slave to the original. Uh, I always liked that. And um, so, It was all really moving for us and, and we weren't like, it was an, an open, it was, I mean, we knew step-by-step step what we wanted to do, but we didn't know how to, how to end all this. And um, then it was the question to, to reach out. Uh, our curator was in, in contact with the Ministry of Antiquities or with some officials and how to, and if, if we wanted to engage like to, 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 to hand out the bus to, to the officials from Egypt and, but we decided we, we don't want to, to connect these, the, the recently freed Nefertiti to another nation state and, and the, the notion of, of possession. And um, so we, we decided to, to go to the desert and, and have her buried or, or bury her uh, in, in the Sahara. And so.
I'm less interested in the return of things than I'm interested in changing the museum itself. And, um, and changing the questions that we ask about collections. Because for me, the museum is not the collection and the museum is not the display. The museum is the process itself. That is the terrain of the new museum that we must advance. And we have to do so inside of the debate and we have to do so by building the resources of So this was cut off the video, but you got the idea. Um, so then back in um, Germany, we went to the uh, CCC, which is the, uh, I think, Europe's biggest uh, hacker convention or, or Congress. And, um, the, and we, we talked about the Nefertiti and we put a torrent up with the data set for, to, uh, to be downloaded. So it was downloaded and shared millions time we 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 tracked it in the beginning then then we didn't track it anymore and it it was just to make sure it is out there <laughs> um and so coming back to the um question of technology i i want to make a remark maybe here on 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 3d scanning itself and um, for me I, I always said it's it's like total or, or absolute photography by this I mean in photography despite the tool of creation being a machine there's still creative potential for expression like the angle of view the aperture depth of field um, etc the 3d scan is a strict reproduction nobody would say oh on how nice, how, how you scanned this uh, so expressively. Um, it doesn't make sense. So, and this becomes in particular relevant when we are thinking about copyright and intellectual property. Um, and more artistically, I, I was asking myself, or I'm still asking in my silent moments, um, when the 3D, 2D image, like a photograph, can be understood as the shadow of the three-dimensional, then the three-dimensional object is the shadow of what? Well, you might say the, the fourth dimension, 4D, and Maybe we can go further and agree that, uh, for instance, we, we are adding time as the fourth dimension. And then again, we have, uh, we have a space time continuum. And then we are asked, what is this the shadow of? Another open question as I'm an artist and not a scientist. I'm allowed to have open questions, I guess. Um, this is what my hand, head is spinning around when I'm sleepless. Uh, not only. I talked about the digital already a bit. And now I want to, to talk a little bit about uh, the preservation of culture. And um, I, I, I want to start with an, with an anecdote. I, I, somebody told me, or I heard somewhere, I'm not sure, it's, it's more like an urban legend. It's um, nothing scientific. And it's more like a story. Once an anthropologist left his research desk and went 
on a field trip to the African continent. One day he saw a medicine man on a rock from, from afar, handling all kinds of pigments and burning herbs. He decided not to disturb him and come back the next day. The next day, the medicine man was gone, but he found the entire rock was full of mysterious signs and drawings. And he decided to reach the, to reach, research them all. He built a big tent around it and protected the, the stone to preserve the precious painting. He was about to study. A year later, after the rainy, se uh, raining season, the medicine man came back, and the anthropolog anthropologist um, saw him. And with shining eyes, he called out to him, look, I preserved all your drawings from the rain. And the medicine man looked at him and said, and where should I do my sing now? So the, the bottom line is like, boom, there's a cultural clash. Like um, even even if, it, if it's meant well, it doesn't mean you get it right. Um, so, and, and in, this, in this, for me, it comes, it, it is like, a, like the notion of, um, from the, the, let's say the dualism of, of to have or to be like, you can have a relationship with somebody or something, but you can be in a relationship to somebody or to something as well. And as language is tricky as always, it, it is fundamental how you approach. And I think often are a really Western or maybe capitalist notion is more tending towards the having something or the, the urge to want to have something and understand the world in more in possession than in being. Um, this, this dualism is, is from, from a book I, I, I read by Erich Fromm, I, I read as a, as a teenager and, and it impacted me. It's from the uh, Frankfurt School of uh, Social Studies and the Critical Thinking. And, um, and maybe adding to this, I, I don't think that, that, that it's, it's really a dualism which is black or white, like that there, there's both in us and we live to both. Uh, we need to have something, but we don't need to have a bottle of water. We need to drink water to survive, but we don't need to have the bottle. But you can say you need to have it first and so on. Like it's, it's something in between, I would say. So a more, less fictionalized um, example of preservation I want to bring up and it's based on experience. And so when, when I went to Petra in Jordan, um, I found kind of similar attitude. Um, I found um, when I was visiting the, the, the site of Petra uh, and they have uh, inside, they have uh, carved these beautiful caves like deep into the, the sandstone rock. And by, this, by design, these caves are naturally acclimatized living spaces. This is, this is in the middle of the desert. So it's hot there. So um, inside the rock, it's cool and fresh. And after declaring the site as a universal world heritage to protect and preserve, the UNESCO management displayed most people uh, living there. Only they, uh, now they live 
in concrete buildings some kilometers from their uh, a place which were then built for them and concrete buildings, the AC is running all the time, you need electricity to run the AC and all what it uh, is and these are square boxes uh, on top. Only unmarried men are allowed to live in the caves still. And I talked to one of them and he told me, um, I'm not stupid, I will not marry, I will stay here. And I mean this, I don't, I don't want to rant against UNESCO. It's, uh, and it is a very multifaceted organization uh, with a diverse field of engagement. The point is even the assumingly noble intention, you're running a high risk of not getting it right. And you can assume that the people lived there for ages and didn't destroy it. They, it's their houses, they, they maintain their houses. Well, the next example I, I want to mention is, is now an example of digital preservation. And it's, uh, in Syria, Palmyra, and another um, what I found there um, when I visited half a year before the revolution started, um, the ruin, the ruins from the Roman period were a vivid scenery of everyday life, a public space used by the youngsters to hang out. The kids utilized the Roman street heading towards the Ark of Triumph to show their riding skills, either on horses or motorbikes. And they actually had races going on between horse and motorcycles. And, um, and I'm very, very happy to admit that this animated version of a heritage site uh, touched me. Um, Later on, uh, Daesh, uh, the IS, partly destroyed uh, the Ark of Triumph of Palmyra and, and, and several other buildings in Palmyra. Um, but before that, it was digitized. Um, and there, I, I want to compare two initiatives uh, who were digitizing uh, Palmyra. The first one, um, I am not so sure who was behind it. I tried to find it out. It was linked to an uni, but the, the uni, uh, to me, dubious. I, I, I did some research, not really deep, but I, I couldn't, I couldn't, it wasn't clear who it was. But what, what they did is they, they, they obtained an, an, an data set of the, of the Ark of Triumph, and then uh, made it a three, uh, a one to three scale model and carved it in, in Carrara marble. They carved it actually in, in Carrara uh, in Italy. Uh, and then they, they brought it to, as an exhibit on, on the Tafalga Square in London. And then it was meant to go to New York and then to Saudi Arabia. And Suppose you think about the entanglement and responsibilities of, of the source nation in the disaster and in the cruelties occurring alongside a proxy war and geopolitical involvement. In that case, it reveals the absurdity and symbolic relevance of those kinds of artifacts and their use or misuse. Um, the, the other example I want to oppose to this is uh, Basel Cartaville and he, he initiated another initiative and uh, initiated initiative and for, for rec reconstructing Palmyra. He, he, was, he was doing work there. He, he was uh, scanning and, and working on, on 
uh, he was a free, free cultural advocate and uh, trying to digitize Palmyra or, or he, he, he was on uh, doing this work when he went missing in 2012. And uh, 2017, the news was confirmed that he was being executed by the Assad regime already in 2015, so two years uh, prior to this, and uh, spent the rest of the time in the jail before. And um, Basel wrote, wrote to a friend uh, in a letter from prison Authorian regimes feel the danger of technologies on their continuity, and they should be afraid of that, as code is much more than tools. It's an education that opens useful minds and moves nations forwards. So what, what I wanted to point out, or what, what, what does it show? an artifact or, or heritage site can be preserved in, in many different ways. And even a 3D model might be pretty uh, similar. Even the 3D model might be pretty similar the one to another. Um, but the attributed story or the meaning can be diametral different. Um, so context matters and intention is crucial. And I think this is true for many things in life. Um, and I would go further and, and say that we are dealing with cultural memory in, with emphasis on, on memory, which by its nature is non-tangible. In its material form as archeological objects or monuments often appear solid and firm, it takes crude machinery to undo them. Yet preserving these material rem remnants by digital means or other means, it is no guarantee to pre prevent the loss of the inherent or associated meaning and cultural memory. Such artifacts potential is to transcend time, not to be forgotten and not to to a forgotten past culture, but to remember another temporality, another present. This is crucial. And this is, this thought is not for me. This is an archaeologist I work with. Um, we are dealing with people, they lived in present times. It's not, it's not a dead culture. Like even if we talk about 3000 years, it, back then it was present. Like, um, and the decontextualization, appropriation, and cultural fracking of these objects led this potential to be lost and overwritten. It is a very delicate task to preserve. Um, Young, yeah, is it okay if I ask a question here? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for, for all of this. Um, and I know we're running a bit on the end of our time, so I want to make sure we have a chance for, uh, the students to ask questions, but what you're talking about here is really resonating with me as a ethnic Greek. I grew up hearing my grandmother talk about the Elgin marbles, um, mm -hmm. and a similar situation, something that is very much present times for her even now. Uh, something that culturally, you know, has a lot of meaning to her, the fact that those marbles are, you know, don't uh, belong to her country of origin. Um, and one thing that she talks a lot about is this idea of ownership and, and pride in her own country. And I thought this was interesting when you mentioned that you had decided to, um, you know, not put the... Um, your copy of the uh, Nefertiti bust back into the hands of the state, another state actor. Mm. Um, and I'm just interested if you could talk a bit about that and how that plays into the sense of, um, or, or plays sort of against the sense of national ownership and, you know, that sort of tension there.
Um, sure. I mean, the, 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 the desert itself is, is it's, 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 a, it's a really interesting, uh, not only concept, but place or actually a non-place, an utopos, an, an utopia. Hmm. And so by, and by bringing her there, it is, um, it opens up, it opens up. And, and I think, and, and this is not like in, in the arts, it's not all to withdraw an, 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 uh, an art piece from, from the perception. It is like, like, like uh, maybe not the best, like Christian and his wife, like they're putting, uh, uh, they're hiding the objects, but it's not, not the best example, but, um it's it's more like it it's not something but there i mean it has to do with a kind of a, an artistic or, or or an ego death as an artist like it's not about you uh so it's not it's not me uh which story this object is 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 painted with or it is it is set free um so and the the other thing it's i think burial is culturally it's such an important act like that we that we let loose let, that that we let go things let, that that we that we end things that that we really decide and and that that we that we don't miss anymore and, and let go in a way like um, burial, like, I mean, for all these, I mean, when we're talking about the hundreds or like here in Berlin in, in the Charité, like these human remains, like they are still there. Like it, it is, it shows how a society, how, how developed or how how fine how fine and sensible a society articulates itself when they when they manage to bury or when when they bury when the act of burial is is uh, performed beautiful thank you thank you so much same uh... Yeah, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, you've given us a lot to think about, and I wanted to open it up to the audience. If anyone has a question, um, you can unmute yourself and, you know, even show yourself on video if you want. Um, we do have a question from Maria. I don't know if Maria wants to ask this question herself. Um, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, thank you so much, John. I'm like, lots of things are also brewing in my head after your talk. It's, uh, it's wonderful. I was just writing in the chat. Um, I love the part where you said, you know, it's not really about you. It's not about this individual, whether that's um, a, a museum or a state. Um, so given that, it, do you believe that it's the people's responsibility to tell these stories of history? Because usually history is kind of told through some person's perspective, some narrative, usually maybe textbooks in the classroom. And if it's a textbook, then the teacher's uh, interpreting it. So if that's the way we usually um, learn about history, how are we quote unquote gonna fix that? Is it our responsibility now? Is it the crowd's job to kind of um, tell the story from now on? Mm. I mean, this this is, this is, uh... This is this is a really uh, uh, important uh, and, and crucial question. I, I think. I mean, you're you're addressing the the hierarchy of knowledge, no? And um, how who is who is to decide? Like, what we learn is actually. And I mean, if if we go back. Uh, um, Okay, now I have several things in my head. I, I need to I need to think. Um, 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 I think for 
I mean, you 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 talked about two things. Now the the hierarchy of knowledge, and then and then you you linked it to education, like uh, um, how in our on our. And I think that there's this would be the the next project I'm I would talk about because I'm desperately running out of time. I noticed, um, um, but this this was about the the dinosaur and the the dinosaur talks about the this uh, knowledge and how how like the the dominant the the dominant uh, structure of knowledge like the like the the Western the Western, let's name it like this, the, the Western knowledge is not um, letting in any other things as their own, like indigenous, uh, indig indigenous data and indigenous. Um, so I, I was talking about a, a conference we hosted at the Buffalo University uh, with Danny Gayton from Standing Rock and WJT Mitchell uh, from the Chicago University. and. So he wrote the book, A Last Dinosaur, and, and Danny Gayton uh, has done research on this as well. And um, so it was like, it was actually later, after this conference, people came up to me and said, this was the first time a Native American was talking in this university. And this is a university with tradition, like with long, like, and um, how, how close we are, how, I mean, um, I don't know. This is this is really a difficult question because to getting it right or getting it wrong, like it's not how to how to step out of our scheme, how how to step out of our routine. This is this is the, the tools we use are designed to understand the world in a certain way, and like Watzlawick is saying. One who has a tool only, one who has for a tool only a hammer, sees in every problem a nail. Like, um, it is, but it is about, I think, in the first place, it is assumingly nobody wants to harm each other. We, we want to learn from each other. It, it is about this intention. And it, it but it is not only it needs to go further i but i can't i i don't have an answer thank you i i, I enjoyed it i mean it's something that i think we should all be thinking about so thank you uh, i have one question but i do want to make room for people who are uh listening so does anyone have a question anyone want to ask something Okay, so I guess I'll be the last person to ask a question. Um, so I've been, I, I do think about these things a lot. And as you know, Nikolai, I've also worked on preservation projects. And what strikes me is thinking about where the technology is developed and deployed from. And so oftentimes there are Euro American institutions that have the ability and the financial stature to be able to carry out these preservation projects and related to Maria's question also have the power to determine what gets written into history based on what gets documented. And so I'm curious about both of you and Nora were based in Berlin um, during this project and you were able to get the tools and the ability to kind of carry out this project as at least the Nefertiti project. And I'm just curious what the response was of artists and cultural heritage experts that you were talking to in Egypt who um, either don't necessarily have access to the same tools or may want to also carry out these kind of subversive projects, um, but may not have the ability to or the training to, to do so. So I'm curious what you think, what you think about that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, that's, um, I have to uh, I have to think about, it, but I, I think this was on actually on on my on my uh, on my final uh, remark on 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 and it it resonates like um, it 
like how it, it would be a really long answer, but it, it's because um, it's an important topic and and it it talks about uh, it talks about identity and uh, uh, being self aware of you're talking about privilege uh, privileges no you, yeah um, so. Um, yeah, because like, what I find really striking about your work is that you're using these dominant tools that are used by museums and other institutions to display their wealth of knowledge. You're using that as a method to kind of subvert and intervene, right? This is kind of what I find striking about your use of technology. Um, and so, yeah, the question is just about what the response was in Egypt with people that you had talked to about the Nefertiti project. Ah, well, I mean, all all kinds of and and I mean, and even harsh one, even things I don't want to mention here uh, about Nefertiti being a a bad girl. Let's frame it like this: uh, to being there with the with the museum's director doing their thing. And I mean, if if I see how museum's directors talk about the most pretty uh, ambassador of Egypt, like really it, it, these, these are responsible person and they behave like, like, uh, um, like they don't have like, these are not gentlemen, like you, you know what I'm saying? It's, uh, and, and they, they are heavily funded and they are producing in my opinion, it's it's they have so much money to do so many things, and they are producing producing uh, VR and AR banalities instead of realities. Like, but in in the end, like it, it is perceived it is perceived as as something. If if I go with my son into in in the museum, I mean, it is taken for granted. It's almost like. If it if if you see it in the television or in the news, it is true. No, like it's, um, and it would it would be so. I mean, at, at least at least for me, it, it would take so little to do good with all this, and they would receive so much love and gratitude. And I don't know why they come across this idea. I really don't get it. Don't know. Well, I think you've left us with a lot to think about. Um, and thank you so much for your time uh, and for coming here and sharing your project with us. I really appreciate it. Um, and if Marie and Mark don't have anything to add, then I think we can end it here. Thank you so much.